Oh, do but think you stand upon the rivage and behold a city on the inconstant billows dancing. For so appears this fleet majestical. In August 1914, Britain went to war with a very small army and the greatest navy the world had ever seen. The first duty of the Royal Navy was to defend the British Isles against dangers defined three and a half centuries earlier by Sir Walter Raleigh. There are two ways in which England may be afflicted. One by invasion, the other by impeachment of our trades. A hundred years after Raleigh, the Marquis of Halifax wrote, To the question, what shall we do to be saved in this world, there is no other answer but this. Look to your moat. The first article of an Englishman's political creed must be that he believeth in the sea. Ever since Trafalgar in 1805, Britain's fleet majestical had been the envy and despair of other powers. Wherever there's water to float a ship, said Napoleon, we're sure to find you in the way. In 1900, Germany began to build a fleet, a battle fleet. Admiral von der Goetz told the Reichstag, The maritime superiority of Great Britain, overwhelming now, will certainly remain considerable in the future. But she is compelled to scatter her forces all over the world. With the increases about to be made in the German fleet, we will be in a position to measure our strength with ordinary British naval forces in home waters. The very foundations of Britain's security were placed in hazard. The threat was unmistakable. Sir Edward Grey, the Foreign Secretary, expressed its full extent. If the German fleet ever becomes superior to ours, the German army can conquer this country. There is no corresponding risk of this kind to Germany. For however superior our fleet was, no naval victory would bring us any nearer to Berlin. There were two courses open to Britain, to negotiate to limit the German fleet or to increase her own. In 1908, the Kaiser ruled out negotiation. A good understanding with the English is not desirable at the cost of the completion of the German fleet. Whether the British like it or not is immaterial. If they want war, they can have it. We are not afraid of it. Britain met the challenge by stripping her overseas stations and concentrating her scattered navy in home waters. Sir John Fisher, First Sea Lord, wrote reassuringly, We will soon have in home waters two fleets, each of which is incomparably superior to the entire German fleet fully mobilized for war. So sleep easy in your beds. Battleships and cruisers returned home from distant oceans, a holiday for the Arab smuggler or the Malay buccaneer. Yet this was not enough. In 1906, Britain had launched HMS Dreadnought, faster, bigger, more heavily armed. All existing battleships were rendered obsolete. And in theory, all the shipbuilding nations were now on equal terms. The naval race began.
bigger ships, heavier armaments, 12-inch guns, 13.5-inch guns, 15-inch guns. When war began, it was Britain who had won the race. She had 24 dreadnoughts and battle cruisers ready to fight, to Germany's 16. She also had the moral advantage of a century of unchallenged supremacy. One of the officers on board the ship where I served said one of the first days of the outbreak of war, I'm quite sure all of us will find our bones lying at the bottom of the sea within the next 10 days, and I have decided to eat nothing until my death, red caviar. Well, he kept that up as far as I know for three days, and then he gave it up just to avoid bankruptcy. To Britain's naval strength was added that of France. German policy had made allies of the old enemies of Trafalgar. Together, the Allied fleets ringed the German and Austrian fortress of Europe. Colonial possessions throughout the world provided the fleets of Britain and France and Germany with bases for supplies and repairs. They also formed a network of radio stations, connecting distant squadrons with their home command. Above all, they served as coaling stations. To steamships, coal was life. A heavy ship ate a ton of coal for every mile steamed at high speed. When she refueled, up to 2,000 tons of coal would have to be loaded into her bunkers. So, across the world, the naval powers had built up chains of coaling stations and the filthy colliers that replenished them with the sinews of naval glory. Coaling ship was a hated task which might take from dawn to dusk or longer. It was all right while we was breaking the surface of the coal, but as you got lower and lower into the hole, so it got terrible. In fact, you was eating coal dust all the time you were down there. And your nose got blocked up, your eyes got blocked up, and we were jolly thankful when it was finished. Only one more day of coaling. One more day, oh, rock and roll me over. Only one more day. Only one more day of working. One more day, oh, rock and roll me over. Only one more day. In August 1914, Britain placed entire trust in the Royal Navy, supreme invincible repository of imperial might. Sleep quiet in your beds, Admiral Fisher had said. We will be incomparably superior to the entire German fleet. Yet there were those who were uneasily conscious of new factors. A naval revolution had been silently in progress, underwater. The mine and the submarine created dangers to which the largest dreadnoughts were vulnerable. No one knew how these underwater weapons would affect the great fleets. An American admiral had once said, damn the torpedoes, full speed ahead. And close observers knew that Britain had lagged behind in developing the underwater armaments. We had no efficient mine, no properly fitted minesweepers, no arrangements for guarding our ships against mines, no anti-submarine precautions, no safe harbour for our fleet. The lack of submarine defences for the British fleet, even in its home base, haunted the Commander-in-Chief, Admiral Jellico. I was always far more concerned for the safety of the fleet when it was at anchor in Scarpa Flow in the early days of the war than I was when the fleet was at sea. Unsuspected uncertainties hovered around the Royal Navy as it went to war. 